Welcome back to our study in the book of Philippians. I'm Dick Baker, your teacher, and it is an honor to be able to share the Word of God with you. Today we'll be looking at the final chapter, the first half of it, and uh, then we'll do our last uh, session, which will finish the book. Uh, today we're looking at joy and resting, and you'll see how it fits in in just a minute. The theme of the book of Philippians, the theme verse, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, chapter 1, verse 21. And here we get an idea of uh, where Philippi is. Uh, it's on the north Aegean Sea. It's in Greece, even that today. And you can see Thessalonica and the route that Paul would have used. Thessalonica is used in Philippians. And so there's there's interaction between these two churches. And here's a larger picture. The church was founded uh, on Paul's second missionary journey. And that is in green. You can see Philippi at dead center at 12 o'clock at the top. And so we've seen joy in living and serving and in knowing. Uh, now we have joy in resting. And we want to share with you, we will be just looking at steadfast and rejoicing in the first four verses and then wrapping it up with prayer and supplication. Uh, this, is an, this is an incredible nine verses. Uh, it has a lot of verses that you've memorized or, or are going to be very familiar um, and so my prayer is that uh, the Lord will open our hearts and, and our eyes and our ears to things of God that we can learn and be better Christians because of it. All right, so let's get busy with steadfast and rejoicing, and we're underway. Therefore, uh, therefore means because of chapter 3, what's been written there. He goes on and says, all right, because of chapter 3, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And so the, the statement here is because all that I've shared with you, I want you to be steadfast. I want you to stand firm and be strong. And the phrase stead, uh, stand fast means stand firm. But it was a Roman command. Stand fast meant to be steadfast. Don't move. Be true to your post. Don't leave it. And so the, the mission that God's called this church to, and the members, Paul is encouraging them and telling them, don't leave your post. And today, as God's people, we need to keep our post at our churches and uh, keep serving the Lord and to serve in steadfastness. The word crown here is the Greek uh, Stephanos, uh, which is we get Stephen and Stephanie from, and it uh, just simply means crown. It was given to an athlete. It's a crown of achievement. And so before we go any further, I told you there's lots of yummies and interesting things and excellent things in these first nine verses. <clears throat> there are five crowns in the Bible that relate to, to Christians. And uh, there's other crowns in the Bible, a lot of them, but these relate just to us. Uh, we don't get them all necessarily, possibly, some can. But uh, let's look at them and I'll share the scriptures with you and what they're about. The first one's one, sort of the one we've been looking at here, the incorruptible crown. It's the servant or the service crown. And this crown will be given to those, the servants of God, who have victory over the world and the flesh and of Satan. They've, stung, they've stayed steadfast and they've run the race. And so see how this verse goes along with what we just read in verse 1. And, and every man that strives runs the race faithfully and truly and honestly for the mastery is temperate in all things. It means he's true. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. So I don't, we're running out in a race in the Olympics. We get a, we get a medal, but that medal is not going to be around forever. It's, it can be corrupted. It decays. It gets rust on it. 
Uh, but we, but he says, but we run the race. We stand true and finish the course for an incorruptible crown, a service crown for God's people that stay in the race. There's the crown of rejoicing, and that's a soul winner's crown. We are our hope, our, you are our hope, our joy, and the crown of rejoicing. We will be proud of when our Lord Jesus Christ comes. And he's talking, Paul's talking to the Thessalonian church about winning people to the Lord, and they receive a crown of rejoicing. There's the crown of life, and this is a martyr's crown. Uh, two references for us here. Great blessings belong to those who are tempted and remain faithful. After they have proved their faith, God will give them the crown of eternal life or the crown of life. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to put some of you into prison. That he will do this to test you, and you will suffer for ten days. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so we, the crown of life is not just a martyr's crown, but we, we could die for the Lord and be willing to do that for the cause of Christ. But there's suffering in between, and this is a, this is a crown of life that's given to God's people that really serve the Lord under hard circumstances. There's a crown of glory, uh, belongs to the pastors, to, I'll use the word full-time servants of the Lord. And when the chief shepherd, Christ, appears, that you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So Peter is writing that to that church and the leadership there. And there's the crown of righteousness. And those, this is the one who love and are looking for the, the return of Jesus Christ. Now the prize is waiting for me to the crown that is right with God. The Lord, the righteous judge, will be giving it to me in that day. And not to me only, but to also to everyone else who is eagerly looking forward to his coming. 2 Timothy 4.8 so these merit some real good study, and I would encourage you to go back and take these references, and there are others that I did not include, and check these crowns out and, and just see what the Lord has to say about them. All right, let's get to verse 2. Now we're learning some of the membership of the church again. I beseech Yodia and beseech Syntyche. Uh, my home preacher that I grew up in our home church called uh, Sintaichi, Sintachi, uh, because these two ladies seem to have a problem, that, that they be of the same mind in the Lord and have the same attitude. So there's probably some squabbling going on here. I don't know exactly, but these are good women. These are good Christians. And Paul writes and says, I've, I've just heard of the squabble. You don't need to do this. Uh, get Get a, a right heart back and get a right attitude for the Lord. And so here, let's just go back a little bit from Acts 16 when this church was founded. We know that Paul and Silas came to town and started the church. We know they were thrown in jail. But what he did first was uh, Paul met uh, Lydia and some people down by the river. And he preaches to the gospel to these women. And it's a good chance these two were part of that group. And they are saved and they get to know the Lord and they go home and they share the gospel and they get saved. We also know that the Philippian jailer, uh, when uh, Paul and Silas were thrown in jail in Philippi, that uh, when the angel of the Lord released them, that they were able to lead that man to the Lord. And the Bible says he goes home and he leads his whole family and all his servants to the Lord. All right, so now you've got a big gathering already. You've got a good number of converts, and they start meeting in the house of Lydia. So that's where the first church of Philippi began and how it began and who was involved and where these two women would uh, be involved at. All right, now I entreat you also... True, entreat means ask something for someone. He says, I need to ask you of something. You that are true yoke fellows, uh, yoking, yoking together, basically. Um, actually, the, the Greek word is synzygous. Yeah, I've tried to pronounce that three times in a row quickly. And that's where we get our word synergy from. So it's talking about there's really some power when 
you, we're, we're together, that we're yoked together and we're going the same direction. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. So he's saying, okay, people in the church, take these two ladies, get them under your wing again and get them with you and get the God for the sake of the gospel. With Clement also, all right, so here's another member of the church, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So he says, let's get, get the church together. Get them to refocus. Remind them of why we exist as a church. And then get busy with that mission. All right, so let me see here. I need to finish reading this. I'm sorry. And with other of my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So book of life is mentioned four times in the Bible. Three of them are in Revelation. Philippians is the other one outside of that. And Revelation was written by John. So this is the book that contains the names of those that are saved and have received Christ as Savior. And uh, here are the three Revelation references. I think it's good that we hear, we hear them too. He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And here are the two last ones. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And there shall be in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So be wise. Know Christ is your Savior. Receive him if you have not. All right, here's the Philippi church membership role so far that we know. And we have the jailer and his household, Lydia and her household and friends. Epaphroditus is the pastor, Iodi, uh, Iodia, uh, we know is there in Syntyche and Clement. These are people's names. So these are real people and good chance people that they know are their families also. Let's read on. Rejoice in the Lord. Always and again I say rejoice. And that's just continuous action. And their book ends. The verse starts with it and the verse ends with it. Very important. And how do we rejoice? The Bible says always. Always continuous action. Okay, let's get into prayer and supplication as we really, uh, when we're really getting down to business of just resting in the Lord and, and there's joy in, in the rest that we have in Christ. And we'll see this start to really magnify through prayer is where we're headed. Let your moderation or your re reasonableness in judgment or in your patient steadfastness. So since we've been talking about steadfastness, it might be a good reading from the Greek. It would be, let your patient steadfastness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He's close. And so he wants them to be reasonable and not hard-nosed and I'm a Christian and I don't move off of this, but to have patience and understanding and uh, to be selfless and have respect for other people. Be anxious, a very famous verse now that I've memorized and many of you have, I'm sure. Be anxious for nothing it means careful or pulled in different directions or don't be troubled, all of those things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests and requests arise out of specific needs we have. Let them be made known unto God. <clears throat> so let's talk about three, four aspects of prayer are listed here in that verse. You can go back and read it. But we read about let your prayer, uh, supplication, our requests, and thanksgiving. There are four breakouts and aspects of prayer uh, that we are given. But this is not everything about prayer. But these are the big ones. And so prayer just in itself, whenever you come across and you just read about praying always for you or uh, pray, just pray with a sincere heart. Well, it's talking about prayer, but how to pray with a sincere heart. Um, prayer is is an attitude of worship that we go before the Lord. We're not going and asking for things. We're going and praising God and who God is, and God is a holy God, God is a righteous God, but God is also a forgiving God, a God of grace that he's bestowed upon us. 
So we go before the throne. We need, we need to have a conversation with the Lord on holy ground. There are times then that supplication, and the way to remember what supplication, that aspect of prayer is all about, just look at the front part and just think of supply. My God shall supply all your needs through our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his riches. And so supplication means genuine needs, things that we really, really need. Let God know about that. Then there are requests. This, this leaves needs of perhaps um, just general things to live, to live that we need to specific concerns or burdens upon our heart. What if someone in the family is very ill? What if there's a great financial setback? What if there's persecution going on? This is where you name people. This is where you name situations and lay, lay it before the Lord. And always there's thanksgiving. That's genuine gratitude and thanksgiving for, from our heart. And the, now because of that, if we come to the Lord and we pray that way, the scripture goes on and talks, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts or our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So let's do the Greek on this, and I think we'll understand this promise as, 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 a, as a bounce back through verse 6 and the aspects of prayer. So, and, and the peace of God, which passes, or it is superior to any kind of understanding or ways that we think and say, well, God, I'm expecting you to answer this prayer this way. Uh, we need to step back and, have, and know that when we've prayed that the peace of God is there and he gives us that peace, leave it with the Lord. Don't try to make your prayer work out. Let God work it. And we need, and God will give us that which is superior to all understanding. And then it says, in the peace of God shall keep our hearts. And that's the center of our emotions, our thoughts, our decisions, and our minds. And that's the thought is that's the thoughts that issue from the heart and the attitudes. And they are at peace through Christ Jesus. So this is what prayer gives us. It gives us peace of God. It guards our hearts and it guards our minds and how they need guarded. And as we pray and our prayer time gets perhaps longer, it gets strengthened, gets more focused in life, uh, we'll see that our, that our hearts, the, the fortresses around our hearts and our minds from the world and Satan are very get very strong. Well, now we read in the Bible, and number three is the peace of God that we read in verse seven. And I wanted to make comment, and I ran across this, and I thought this was good. There's three pieces that are God and peace. And let me read the last one first, and then we'll do one and two. The peace of God. This is the peace spoken of in verse seven we just did. It is beyond all mind. That's be, that means it's beyond all our power of thinking. It's superior. The peace of God. All right, number one, we read peace from God in the Word of God. And Paul continually uses this as an introduction to his letters. You'll find this up front in the first two, one, two, or three verses. It reminds us that our peace comes to us as a gift from God. And so instead of saying hello to the churches, he says, hey, I'm Paul, the apostle of God. I've been called. May the peace of God or in the peace from God be with you. Then there's the peace with God. And this describes our relationship that we enter into with God through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. This is a child of God that we have peace with God because of the cross of Christ. Okay, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. These 
these are matters that are that are spurting out of prayer, the gushing out of prayer. And these are things that that we are to think on these things. These are meditation issues here. And so as we pray, there prayer, some prayer is prayer and meditation. In our prayer time, we meditate on things. And we could th- meditate on these issues. And here is right out of the Greek what these are. Uh, whatsoever things are true, that is really talking about whatsoever thing is truth or truthfulness or real. Uh, when we read the word honest, that means it's worthy of respect or honorable. Pure is pure, undefiled, holy. Lovely is pleasing and acceptable. That we're not, we're not in our church and in our life and our neighborhood like a bull with horns. We're just gouging people and we're hard to get along with and contrary. But we have a pleasing disposition. We're acceptable, not just to the Lord, but others. Think on, take into account, meditate on these things. This is where we get meditation from. Think on is to meditate on them. And then uh, some of these words are just given again. And these, these are the things that create a state of peace. And I've just shared them with you. But just as a reminder, and I think the statement, the things that these are the six things that give us the peace of God and create that peace through our Lord. And so the book ends here are virtue and praise at the end of the verse. And we're told that virtue is our, involves our moral life. Praise is our spiritual life. And they, they're on both ends and in between is everything else. Meditate on this and meditate on it often. Then the last verse for our wrap up of this section. Those things which you have both learned and received, those meaning and those things, uh, meaning the past few verses, and you received and you've heard. Received means that you were taught these in the past as a tradition. Tradition's not wrong if it's based upon truth and is truth, and heard, and seen in me. So Paul said, these things that I've just mentioned, you've seen them in me. I hope you do. And he says, you do them also. Practice them. And the God of peace shall be with you. So verse 9 is sort of the wrap-up of Paul just saying, hey, you've seen this in me. I've spent my life serving the Lord, and I understand in good and bad I understand the God of peace and what he is and what he can do for me and how I should be with him. Father, thank you so much uh, for these verses. They're really challenging. We can't possibly grasp everything. And especially the power of prayer, and what it can do to change us and change others and change the world. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you for the peace that we of God that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. We know we have peace with with God also. And peace does come from you. So we give thanks and we praise you for that. Uh, Father, I just pray we grow stronger and we'd be once again steadfast in these things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, join us for the last lesson as we wrap up everything in the book. I want to thank you for your time today. God bless you all.